I'm here today uh, representing uh, a group at UMass Boston. And our, my talk is a little bit different in the sense that it's mainly going to be about infrastructure. Uh, we're trying to support science. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I'm very excited to be here. I didn't, I've been working hard and wasn't, I was, I was asked to come to represent the group. There's uh, half a dozen or so professors and a whole bunch of other people participating. And so I was very busy teaching my courses. And all of a sudden, last week, I said, oh, you've got to get ready. Then I focused on getting ready. And only, only uh, last night did I start to look at the program. Uh, it turns out that this program, in some ways, uh, all the other speakers are a lot closer to my interests uh, because I've worked on citizen science and I'm very interested in, in uh, biodiversity conservation. There's a lot of examples here. So I'll sort of try to bring some of those in at the end. Um, UMass Boston, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is at the other end of the red line. It's the public school, public university in Boston. Uh, it's a, uh, by the JFK Library, right on the ocean. It's a very pretty place. Um, and it's uh, different and it's a commuter school and it's got a real high diversity of, of uh, students. All right, yeah, that's my pointer. And if I go yeah. like, forward here. that's forward, okay, so good, black, you don't want that. okay. Okay, go back, huh, I'm going the wrong way totally. Back, back, back. You're seeing the whole talk backwards. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. It's the whole talk backwards. Let me try this way. Go th through it forward. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> That's way behind. Sorry. I don't know what to do. I'll, t I'll go slower. Let it catch up. OK. This slide is to remind me to tell you that uh, we established this center because most people live along the coasts. Uh, half the population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. It's not a place scientists have traditionally studied because of the wild interactions there. It's a place where there's a lot of environmental problems. If you stop to think about it, uh, we put a lot of things into oceans. There's a lot of problems with, uh, uh, with erosion. Uh, there's uh, problems with invasive species, so there's a lot of activity right along the coastlines. Um, and there are also, uh, because of all uh, the activities we uh, uh, undertake there, whether it's building or ports or whatever, there's big conflicts between people and environment. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of activity uh, with governments trying to regulate what we do. So whenever there's a problem, there's a lot of stakeholders. And if you're familiar with a whole host of the problems, take just for instance fisheries, you know there's a long history of intense dialogue, arguments, vo very vocal arguments about regulating fisheries while the fish disappear, right? We've lost the top uh, uh, layer in the uh, food web, the top predators are gone, we're rapidly consuming fish, and we're talking about it and talking about it. It's very hard for us to, to do something about it. So. Um, our perspective is if we can help provide better data, that may uh, advance um, discussions and uh, influence public policy. So we have a, a wide range of different people from scientists and engineers to lawyers involved in Cessna. I'm going way too fast. Back. Try. Um, we're trying to develop hardware and cyber infrastructure to uh, monitor coastal resources. and. We're specifically tasked uh, in a partnership with industry, education, and management. Uh, it's a, it was unusual for me when we first got our bit of money from the, to start from the University of Massachusetts. We were asked to develop industrial partners. Now, I know in certain universities, that's a long tradition. Here at MIT, you have very strong um, <clears throat> contacts with industry. We didn't at UMass Boston. It wasn't something that we'd focused on much. But we went out and got some local partners. And uh, it's proved to be really uh, a good thing to do. It's really, it's really fun to work for these people, and developing those connections, I think, has a lot of advantages. OK. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about a pond sensor here. I'm going to talk about a tidal, eh, tidal gauge we worked on. I'm going to talk about this network we've got in place now here, and some smart software. 
Um, here's the first project, this pond sensor. Um, we have a, a GK12 grant from NSF. <laughs> and uh, uh, we work in Milton and Boston with that GK12. And we went to the students and said, you want to monitor this pond? And we asked them to uh, go through a standard engineering design process, these uh, fifth graders. And they said, after that process, they said, well, we want a swan. We want a swan sensor. So this is what was a plan on a napkin. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, then we went and got parts, looked for parts. So they, the, uh, the idea is always to go off the shelf. We try not to, I'm always hitting the wrong button, go off the shelf. Uh, so we got um, solar panels, panels on set corporations down on the Cape. They do a lot of monitoring. They found this SWAN model and started to build it. Um, there's what it finally turned out to be. Um, it's got multiple sensors. It's solar power and so on. Now I'm shaking this and it's going. Anyway, it finally got, it turned out to be a big event. The fire department had to come to this event. The school teachers, everybody showed up. Uh, and the kids were there, uh, great success. It got launched, it produced real-time data so the kids could look at it in school, right? Everything went well until what happened? Normally birds would migrate south when what happens? We have lots of ornithologists I can tell in the audience. What happens? What happens to swans? They go south, right? Jesus is just going for it. Yeah, in this case, uh, the bird, the, the, our model was still in the water when the pond froze up. We had to go out there and chip out the model. <laughs> the birds would have been smart enough to leave. Our sensors weren't smart enough yet. So eventually we'll have uh, sensors, uh, packages that are smart enough to get out of the water or sink to the bottom. OK, next uh, story is about um, a tidal gauge. Um, in this case, uh, we are familiar with coastal hazards here. We get these storm waters with, with hurricanes or northeasters. I really don't like this. <laughs> um, and um, uh, in one particular uh, example you see on a map here, you see flooding that occurred in situate. So <clears throat> the National Weather Service and NOAA are actually talking together. I'm told that this is quite an accomplishment by federal agencies. And um, the uh, upshot was that they thought it would be really nice to have more data about tides. Tide gauges are incredibly expensive. What do you think a tide gauge costs? What do you guess? 10000 50,000, 1,000, 10,000, what do you think? $100,000, standard tiger gauge is $100,000. Well, it's very well engineered, it lasts, you know, that meets a lot of specs. Anyway, we produced one for $10,000. Now I'll touch it, see if it works. Uh, oh, to make a forecast here, that's where they were trying to forecast, that's what Noah wants to be able to do, a visual forecast. We produced one, actually I should say two of the guys who were part of the Start a little business, Charybdis did. What, what am I doing wrong? What do you think? I, I'm too magnetic, I'm too, I don't know, or something. Uh, anyway, it's just a simple little uh, sensor that sits on the dock uh, down in Situate, um, but it produces real-time data. And lots of people can see this data and it can go into a real-time model that we have at UMass Boston. So it helps calibrate, uh, Is that it? Is it just going automatically because it's on slideshow? Is that the problem? Yeah. It's on the, it's the wrong setting on my, my. And this. If I put it on, I want view slides, not slideshow. Slideshow. Full screen. This is going to be slideshow, then, isn't it? What do you think? I mean, if the past slideshow would just, instead of being automatic, you would, there it's going automatic again, you're right. So that's the problem. The easy solution is to push forward and then just push backwards. Okay. Where'd the mouse go? No, I can't. There's a the mouse. I go previous next. 
Quoi I just I, it shouldn't go forward automatically, should it? That's been the problem. Yeah, I think that, I think that's right. What? Automatic. Can I unclick that? Oh, under this menu? Yep. Slideshow. Fix that there. OK. Loop continuously. It's checked now. That's a good option. Loop continuously until escape. I can uncheck that too. Okay. Sorry for the. Now I can go to show. Somebody must have used change the settings on me. See if I can go. Yeah, it's the wrong thing. Yeah, that'll work. Now that that'll work properly now. <clears throat> okay. There we go. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, this will work now. That will work properly now, I think. So now we can, we can get the data and they can see it. So it was done in, uh, they, they accomplished this in about, uh, I think in about uh, a month for $10,000 they did it. OK, now. Uh, Third example is Beacon, the Boston Environmental Area Coastal and Observation Network. The goal is that we'll eventually have a smart sensor network um, so we can find hot spots and hot moments. And the idea is to, to go from the terrestrial side to the marine side, to go from the headwaters of the Neponset River through the watershed, through the estuary, down into Boston Harbor. One of the things that we've done is we've tried not to compete with the big oceanography community. Woods Hole is a huge entity. There are lots of, lots of universities that have huge oceanography. So we're trying to stay close to the coast, less than, less, uh, less than 30 meters of water. But bridge that, uh, bridge that uh, interesting area across the boundary. Um, and then the other idea for this uh, beacon uh, uh, network is that we can be a test bed for sensors. So if somebody had a sensor they wanted to test, in theory, we're going to be able to hang it off this set of buoys or these stations. First go is a Silicon Laboratories microcontroller, one of the components. This is an onset data logger. Uh, and then the first four buoys are here. Uh, they're about $10,000 a piece, which is cheap for oceanography. And there's a buoy in the water. There, this Google map isn't so good. But you can see here that this is. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, I mean, to the, the Boston Harbor with all the islands. And, uh, and we have a, a buoy three is there up in the estuary. Buoy two is here. A buoy five is there. Buoy one is here. There's another buoy going further up river. And then there's going to be five land stations, too. Um, and so those are starting to record, uh, record data. Um, out on Thompson's Island, we also have now some sensors working. And we have sensors in a variety of other places. We have some sensors on Nantucket Island where we have a field station. So we're starting to build up this network. Um, off of these big buoys, we have this number of um, uh, data streams coming. Um, and one of the fun things they did is they had to figure out uh, direction because the buoy spins with the current. So you don't have any fixed orientation. So you got to know which way the buoy's pointing to find out wind direction and, and uh, current. Uh, OK, the last one I want to talk about is uh, some efforts by the software engineers to do uh, some smart sensing. Um, here's a simple example of some data that was coming off one of the stations we have in which you have chlorophyll and turbidity. And you get these peaks right here, right? two peaks. And the question might be, is this a, uh, some kind of algal bloom? 
if you get these peaks, is something happening like that. Um, for the marine biologists in the, uh, in the audience, uh, they might think, well, maybe it's something else, like benthic re, uh, resuspension. So here you have tidal depth and wave interference with sediments depends on the time of day. Right? Maybe it's just the fact that the tide's going in and out, stirring things up. So uh, they went to work. They built a, a sensor ontology. They have some information about ocean events. They use Jenna as a framework uh, for the, in the web service layer. Um, they have a reasoner. Um, and they've now got a, a real uh, backbone to do some uh, machine reasoning which is when you get these kinds of data, when you get data coming, at this, this amount of data coming this fast, you've got to start doing that kind of thing, OK? Uh, all right, I want to uh, just illustrate a couple more points. Um, I'm the, the most biological of anybody on the team, and I'm hoping to go and monitor more and more things about biology. I'm seeing lots of wonderful examples here. It turns out usually when you start doing monitoring, you start with physical and then chemical, and finally you get to biological, uh, because this, the technologies are expensive. Uh, and difficult to do, and you've heard lots of interesting examples about that today. Oh, it was definitely, I should have said, it was definitely the, the resuspension. Is that, and that's the machine reason, reasoning showed that. Um, here's a fun example that I got off the web of an osprey, Isabel, leaving, leaving Martha's Vineyard, traveling to the Bahamas. And this data are very recent, immediately um, immediately uh, published, put right up on, with Google Maps. 57 hours, 1,400 miles. Pretty amazing, huh? This is the kind of thing that when I was a graduate student, you could never get, right? But now more and more people are doing this kind of thing. The blanks in the trace here are when they, they couldn't upload data. There wasn't satellite contact. Um, but this bird was a, a young of the year on Martha's Vineyard. It, it uh, had been flying around the island, doing a little exploring, and then it just took off. Remarkable. I mean, just unbelievable what animals can do. So we're starting to do this kind of things. People are starting to visualize and see it and, and share it. I work on a, a local problem that's equally of interest to me, um, but much harder. Here's the challenge. Oh, my turtle got cut off. This is a, you can see the critical thing here. This is a yellow neck. This is a Blanding's turtle. Has anybody here ever seen a Blanding's turtle? Really? That's, that's very unusual. They're very rare. There's only three populations in Massachusetts. Do you see them in Massachusetts? Yeah. These are real biologists. These are very <laughs> exceptional biologists. Very hard to see them. Um, they, um, uh, this uh, turtle is, was found up in Georgetown, where there's one population where I work. And uh, there we uh, do some nest protection. And what you see here is a spoon, very advanced uh, technology for scooping out the nest. So we've covered over the nest to protect them. The, the turtles, baby turtles have hatched. <clears throat> and here's the challenge. A baby Blanding's turtle only weighs about 10 grams. And the rule of thumb is you have to have 1 20th the weight to put a transmitter on it. Right? So you need no more than half a gram. Uh, here's the eggshells that we found. And here's a piece of twine that connects to this little sensor down there. This is what a biologist would use now if they didn't have a lot of money. This is a $60 sensor from Onset that, that records temperature, a little hobo data logger. Right? So we met, monitored the nest temperature. And that's important because sometimes development doesn't uh, complete uh, well. The other thing we'd like to be able to monitor is uh, humidity, soil, soil moisture content. And that's, you can get a sensor from hobo to do that, but it costs several hundred dollars. Anyway, so what happens is the turtles hatch, and then they have a journey from the nest to the water, the nest to water journey. And we don't know anything about that. How does a little, tiny little turtle make it back to the, back to the uh, river, back to the ponds? Well, we don't have transmitters. We can't, we can't ever see that. You know, you can put up a drift fence. You can do things like that. But for somebody who likes to make small <laughs> sensors, <laughs> maybe they're going to come from the work that we saw earlier today. That's going to be a great application. It's going to, we're going to learn a lot about turtle biology when we have something like that. OK, the future. One of the things we're doing at uh, uh, Cessna is we want to put, um, put out drifter buoys. So the, the buoys drift with the current, and we can sense what's happening on. 
using our commercial off-the-shelf uh, kind of product, this is a collar that Garmin makes for hunting dogs. Here's the market driving the advancement. So you can get this collar, put it on a buoy, and it'll, it'll, it'll do a good job. It's already packaged. You know, it's all set to go. That's the kind of approach we take. Um, second thing, um, I think everybody, oh, I should ask you, how many people here have a smartphone? Raise your hand. Most of you do. How many have an have a iPhone? About half. I, I would predict it's the younger half of the room that has the iPhone. It's the older half that have the Blackberries, right? Children are still on the rise and waiting for the iPhone. Anyway, uh, because I'm, I, uh, the other part of what I do is electronic field guides and biodiversity citizen science monitoring, I went and got an iPhone. And you can see these apps I have, all about bird identification, except for this one, which is a new one that's not out yet. But this tells you where the hot spots are. You know, there I can track where I walk. It's very useful. Uh, Google Earth. And here's the typical kind of thing you get. This is just a flashlight. I use that all the time when I'm out. <laughs> just turn it into a flashlight. Anyway, I think this is really going to make a big difference. Any advancements we make here, it's, it's just fantastic. And what's so special about these kinds of apps, for me, is that the interface is really good. If I want to figure out something about my iPhone, I give it to a, my 13-year-old daughter. Right? It's the kids who, are, who play with these things. They're really good at it. They're quick to master it. If the, if the interface is good, people will use it. And finally, I want to say that uh, I'm also very interested in games, gaming as a way to involve people. And I'd love to talk to anybody here who's interested in gaming. I don't want to say anything more than that, except to, to make it an invitation. Um, all right, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the mess up with the slideshow. Thank you.